Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us from across Australia for this program from the Shine Dome. I'm Professor Hans Bachor, and I will be your MC for this afternoon. More from me shortly, but first up, I'd like to warmly welcome the Academy of Science Foreign Secretary, Francis Sapowicz, to officially welcome you to this event. Over to you, Francis. Good afternoon, and welcome to Falling Walls Lab Australia 2022. I am Professor Francis Saparovich, Foreign Secretary of the Australian Academy of Science. I begin by acknowledging and paying respect to the Naganawal people, the traditional owners of the lands on which the Academy office is located. The Academy also acknowledges and pays respect to the elders past, present and emerging of all the lands on which the Academy operates and its fellows live and work. They hold the memories, traditions, cultures, and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of Australia. The very first Falling Walls Lab in the world took place in Berlin in 2011, 11 years ago. It has grown from strength to strength. Since then, international labs have taken place in different cities around the world. And last year, Falling Walls Labs took place in 90 countries. The Falling Walls Lab finale is held each year in Berlin on 9th of November and marks the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. The finale gathers 100 winners derived from the international labs. This year, the 100 winners of the international labs will unite to find solutions to the greatest challenges of our time, contributing towards a better world. The top 10 global finalists will compete in the virtual live event, the Falling Walls Pitches, from which one presenter will be awarded winner in the Emerging Talents category. The winner will pitch their breakthrough project on the grand stage in front of a global audience of industry leaders, decision makers, investors, and international media representatives. The opportunity to participate on the global stage is up for grabs by the young researchers presenting at today's event. They were selected in heats held in Sydney and Brisbane. The Falling Walls Lab Sydney was organized by the DAAD, the German Exchange Service, and Euraxis. And the Falling Walls Lab Brisbane was organized by Queensland University of Technology. The Academy would like to acknowledge these partners for their support. Also making Falling Walls Labs Australia possible, we would like to thank the Falling Walls Lab Foundation, the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany, Canberra, Euraxis, Researchers in Motion, and DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service. Labs support interdisciplinary dialogue and international cooperation. They connect aspiring innovators and senior researchers, and they develop new and sustainable ways of scientific communication. Today, we're excited to hear from the 10 researchers and innovators who were selected to present their work, business model, innovative project, social initiative or idea. We wish them the very best of luck for today. I would now like to hand over to our MC for today's event, Professor Hans Bakor. Hans is a fellow of this academy and he's one of the driving forces of the labs in Australia. We thank you, Hans, for your passion and enthusiasm enthusiasm that continues to keep falling walls thriving here in Australia. Over to you. Thank you, Francis. Like in the past, we are presenting to you creative young scientists and great ideas for solutions for the future. Now, due to the pandemic this year, the lab is slightly different from those organized in previous years. It is all online. But that brings a big audience, you, all to us. It is exciting to be here as your MC for Falling Walls Lab 2022. The 10 researchers who have been selected in the earlier round are ready to share their impressive and groundbreaking work. Now, the format today is very tight. Each presenter has just three minutes to make their case to explain the wall that they wish to break down and how they wish to do that. 
This is a competition within Australia. We are most grateful to the panel of distinguished judges who will select today's winner to represent us at the global event. So please welcome our esteemed jury members. We have Professor Chanaputi Yagadish, President of the Australian Academy of Science and Jury Chair. Professor Lynn Beasley, Neuroscientist, Murdoch University, and the Academy Secretary for Education and Public Awareness of Science. Mrs. Rosie Hicks, CEO of Australian Research Data Commons. Dr. Hilary House, Head of Science and Innovation, Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany here in Canberra. Dr. Vanessa Moss, astronomer from CSIO and co-deputy chair of the Academy's Early and Mid-Career Research Forum. We have Mr. Craig Pandy, partner government, education and defense, strategic operations practice at Kearney. And last and but not least, Dr. Michael Schütz, Director of the Jemison Trauma Institute, Chair and Professor of Trauma at Queensland University of Technology. So this jury will look with great passion and intent and select the winner. Now every year, Fording Walls brings together young scientists, entrepreneurs and professionals from across the globe to present their vision and how to make the world an even better place. Now let's watch a video to hear more from the events last year, 2021 in Berlin. I think an event of this kind is a stepping stone for the young scientists who, when they come here, uh, get some recognition for what they are doing and also are able to form networks. Falling Walls Lab is unique because we have 75 young people presenting their idea. Falling Walls is about the most pressing challenges of our time, creating innovative solutions. I want to make science accessible to every single person in this world because the science is there to help humanity and humanity must understand what it is that we're researching. Participation for me means understanding my own work better gaining the skills to present in these sorts of high profile environments with the best equipment and the best people in the world. The opportunities the Falling Walls gave to us to really put the ideas out and really make a change in the world really appealed to me and that's how I reached there. To me, it's really the breadth of ideas, the breadth of across the scientific disciplines. We've faced very large challenges and Falling Walls is a place full of hope on so many levels. So as you have seen, it was a little bit jagged in the video, at least on my screen, but you will get this impression how lively the event is when all 100 people come together in Berlin, and that will be in November. So for our event here in Australia, without further ado, I would now like to introduce the presenters. So we have Breaking the Wall of Pediatric Chronic Pain, Hess Braiding from Queensland University of Technology. We will hear about Breaking the Wall of Space Debris Prevention, Mars Butfield Edison, from the University of Tasmania. Breaking the wall of borders in nursing from Chancha Kurup from the Australian Catholic University. Breaking the wall of hidden carbon emissions in agriculture. 
presented by Martino Malerba from Deakin University. Breaking the Wall of Antifungal Resistance by Danielle Lee from Griffith University. Breaking the Wall of Decarbonizing the Planet, Fiona Hashini, Roy Desmond Godfrey from Monash University. We have Breaking the Wall of Drug Resistance Malaria, Marin Fraser from the Australian National University. Breaking the Wall of Crop Loss, Nipuni Pefa Sanchiji from Queensland University of Technology. Sorry, Nipuni, if I got that slightly wrong. Breaking the Wall of Medical Device Bioactivity, Oliver Lotz from the University of Sydney. We'll hear about Breaking the Wall of Treating Depression from Clara Young from the University of Queensland. So these are our 10 pre-selected topics. And we are looking forward to hearing from these presenters shortly. But now, to say a few words and officially open the event, I would like to welcome Dr. Marcus Edra, Ambassador Designate of the Federal Republic of Germany to Australia. Welcome, Ambassador. Good day. Yes. We're just checking the line over to the embassy. Do you have the communication? Okay. Unfortunately, we have a slight technical glitch. So I think we'll switch now to the president of the Australian Academy of Science, and we'll come back to the Ambassador-designate very shortly. So let me introduce you and welcome Academy of Science President Professor Chanopirti Yagadish to say a few words as today's jury chair. Thank you, Hans. It's a pleasure to join you, our distinguished guests and sponsors, today's presenters, and my esteemed fellow jury members as jury chair for today's competition. Supporting young researchers to develop their careers, promoting international scientific engagement, and building public awareness and understanding of science are three important activities of the Academy, and Falling Walls Lab is a perfect example of this. Good luck to all the presenters. The jury will have a tough job selecting just three winners to attend Falling Walls Lab Berlin in November this year. Thank you, Hans, and back to you. Thank you, Professor Jagadish. And I see we have the line back to the German embassy. So please let me welcome again the ambassador designate, Dr. Markus Edner, to the Federal Republic of Germany. Thank you for joining us, Ambassador Designate. Good afternoon, and thank you very much, Professor Bachor. I would also like to recognize in particular Professor Jagadish and Professor Separovic, and the distinguished jury members, and uh, certainly not least, the falling wall presenters and all the guests out there. Um, I'm obviously not a promising young scientist, as you can see, but um, I'm the new German ambassador to this country. And um, I certainly, after having been here for a few days, didn't want to miss this Falling Walls Australia event. Since uh, 2016, um, the Falling Walls Lab Australia has become a flagship event, as you know, uh, organized by the Academy of Sciences and the German Embassy. And this is why I would like to thank the Academy for organizing this event and the eminent members of the jury for giving their time to support Australia's brightest 
young researchers and innovators. But mostly, I would like to thank you, the presenters. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a moment uh, of truth for you, and I don't envy the jury either. Having looked at your projects, um, I really think you are addressing some of the major challenges of our times. After we seem to encounter a little more technical problem. So I think we'll, yep, we'll, we'll be back. So we just be patient here. My internet we have found you back, uh, stable. Ambassador designate. Yeah, I'm not sure where you lost me, but I was just addressing the young researchers and uh, presenters and thanking them for doing cutting edge research in the areas where we need it most, uh, climate change, health, um, space, I saw and some uh, burning social issues. Um, you are the elites of tomorrow. Uh, you will be decision makers of tomorrow. And hopefully you will also be ambassadors in both directions, Australia and Germany with your background in this competition. It is not by coincidence that this is my first uh, official presentation in my new job. Uh, and it was not a coincidence that my last official presentation in my previous job as the EU ambassador to the Russian Federation was to 66 young Russian researchers who won an Erasmus Mundus scholarship for a dual masters. For us in Germany and Europe, um, it is extremely important to link up to the next generation of uh, researchers and leaders. And this is why I'm extremely happy to be around today. As you know, um, and we note with pride, uh, it was an Australian researcher, Rhys Peary, who won the Global Lab in Berlin in 2019 with his presentation, Breaking the Wall of Broken Glass. And he was named Young Innovator of the Year. So you are standing in a, an important tradition and uh, that is also the expectations we, we put in you. Uh, I would like to congratulate all the participants of uh, the Falling Walls Lab Australia 2022. I wish you all the best of luck um, today. As I said, it, that's the moment of truth. And maybe conclude with the inspirational words of Sir Mark Oliphant, the first president of the Australian Academy of Science. And I quote, going after the unknown is always fascinating. I think it becomes part of your life, this desire to know, end of quote. And in that spirit and in a world which sometimes seems to rely less on knowledge, but more on emotions and fake news, in this spirit, I hope that your desire to know never leaves you and that you will always draw satisfaction from it in your research and in your life in general. With this, I thank you very much and I wish you a successful competition today and uh, we will all be looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Ambassador-designate Dr. Edra, for these warm and welcoming words and the wise words about how we can go about to make it an even better world and work together internationally. So it's time. We will now come to the core of this event and proceed with the presentations. Each presenter will have up to three minutes to pitch their project, followed by two minutes for questions from the jury and the presenter. Our first, second, and third place winners will be decided by the jury and announced at the end of this event today. So thank you audience for joining us online today. We encourage you to engage with the event via either by Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Our Twitter hashtag for today is hash falling walls 22, and you can tag either at falling underscore walls or at science underscore academy. Now, let's get started. Please welcome 
our first presenter. We have Tess Brady from Queensland University of Technology. Hi, I'm Tess and I'm here to talk to you about pediatric chronic pain. Between 25 and 35% of Australian children and adolescents experience some form of chronic pain. That's as many as one in four young people in Australia. For a myriad of complex reasons, it can be incredibly difficult for young people in pain to access adequate care. The current gold standard for care is multidisciplinary pain clinics, but there are only seven pediatric pain clinics in the entire country, all of which are located in major cities with often prohibitively long wait lists. So what solutions can we offer to young people who are facing difficulty accessing care? I would like to introduce you to personalized immersive environments. I have defined personalized immersive environments as co-designed immersive environments created to be viewed through a virtual reality head-mounted device. The use of a head-mounted device is because of its unique, uh, uniquely appropriate ability to utilize multi-sensory engagement. So essentially with how pain functions, the more you can actively engage alternative sensory input, the more effectively you can dull the brain's ability to process pain signals. And research has shown head-mounted devices to be highly effective in this area beyond what can be achieved through traditional distraction techniques. But let's circle back to that idea of personalization. I have been working collaboratively with a Brisbane-based pediatric pain clinic to create a clinically informed co-design kit. This kit has the very first round of these kits have been delivered recently as part of a unique pilot study. This kit uses artistic activities to collect data on the sensory and aesthetic preferences of the individual. This data is then used to inform the design of their very own personalized immersive environment, AKA their happy place. This process is created to be delivered completely remotely and to be used in conjunction with proven mindfulness techniques, the resources for which are available on the pain clinic's website. The design of these happy places is not just about lowering pain with multisensory engagement. It's about mitigating painful experience by actively increasing pleasurable experience. It's about understanding aesthetic pleasure as a functional healthcare intervention, and it's about offering solutions to young people who may be facing barriers to accessing care. I know what it is like to be a kid and be in pain and have no resources to manage that pain because that was my childhood. And to be brutally honest, it pretty much just, just sucked. <laughs> I don't recommend it. It can start to feel like pain is the only thing you're able to feel anymore, but that isn't true. We may not be able to eliminate chronic pain, but we can still break the wall of pediatric chronic pain by giving these kids their very own happy place. Thank you, Tess. Thank you. We now have just two minutes for questions. And please welcome Dr. Michael Schutz to ask Quest, Tess. Many thanks, Tess. Great presentation. It's a, it's a fantastic project. Now, let me ask you, from your experience, is there a particular frequency a child with chronic pain should seek their happy place? Or is the frequency driven by the children themselves? The frequency would be driven by the children themselves. So these uh, virtual environments are designed to be used, as I mentioned in the presentation, in conjunction with mindfulness techniques that are taught through pediatric pain clinics. Um, and as I said, the resources being available on the website so that it can be delivered remotely as well. Uh, but it's about having a space that they can go to when they decide they need it. Pretty much the core tenant of this project is putting the agency over the therapeutic device in the hands of the kids which is why I've chosen a co-design process so that they can be actively involved in the making of the virtual environments as well. Um, so yes, I would say it's something designed to be used as needed uh, with these mindfulness and visualization techniques that they're learning um, and that they have professional you know, therapeutic guidance on. Okay, many thanks. Thank you. We have a little time, so could I ask Craig Pandy to ask a second question? I'm sorry, I can't hear. Hi. Great presentation, thank you. Very thank interesting you. research project. 
I was interested in your mention during the presentation of a pilot that you had run with the clinic in Brisbane. Yes. I was wondering how effective was the pilot and how did you measure that? Um, so at the moment, I have delivered the first round of the, the co-design kits and got those results back. And part of those co-design kits was an inbuilt feedback mechanism uh, where the kids essentially used a traffic light um, um, system, red, green, yellow stickers. Sorry, I'm rushing through because of the time. Uh, to rate the um, how much they enjoyed and understood all of the activities. One of the big goals of this process is that it's supposed to be kind of like a joyful and fun process for the kids to create these environments. And we had like 100% positive feedback from the group of children that we were working with. Um, I'm currently in the process of actually building the virtual environments themselves, so I don't yet have data on the efficacy of the um, of the of the virtual environment products as of yet still early stages but the process very very well really great responses from the kids terrific thank you thank you thank you so much tess michael and craig now that was ambitious what we can do within two minutes so we'll we'll see that we stay within it but you know nothing but a bit of ambition so um let's Welcome our second presenter, Mars Butfield Edison from the University of Tasmania. Thank you very much. Well, hi, I'm Mars Butfield Edison. I'm a computer scientist working on preventing space debris. Space debris today is largely unmanaged. Our methods of active on orbit debris removal are underdeveloped and our preventative legislation is easy to dodge. So the risk faced by our critical space-based infrastructure only grows by the day. Today, our primary method of mitigation is a global collaborative effort called space traffic management. Like air traffic control does for aviation, space traffic management seeks to monitor all objects in near Earth space, plot their trajectories, and put up alerts when an imminent collision seems likely. Unfortunately, while satellites have gotten cheaper and easier to put into space, our space tracking capacity has fallen behind and we cannot afford to spend multiple years and millions or billions of dollars building each new space tracking radar, especially when in the next few years, we're going to need dozens of them. So what do we already have? Well, radio sensors built for astronomical observations have similar hardware capabilities than a radar receiver and we already have dozens or more of them all over the world. But unfortunately, these radio telescopes suffer some issues the same as humans do. A human with two eyes can look at a distance and get a sense of depth. A brain knows how to take those two different perspectives we're seeing and reconcile them into a single image. But for a radio telescope made to look at deep, deep space, looking at something only a few hundred kilometers up is too close. And like a human looking at the end of their own nose, everything goes out of focus. The way that it knows to reconcile those different perspectives breaks down when they become too dissimilar. We end up with this Doppler smearing that makes any of our location detections have enormous margins of error. So we need to change something about their brains. And that's where I come in. I'm building experimental GPU-based software that will run in real time in the back end of large radio telescope arrays, like this one in New South Wales, that will perform some of the traditional transformations that we need to get useful information out of telescope data, such as accounting for Earth's rotation during observations or for radio signals that fall outside of the beam center, as well as integrating novel new algorithms that will account for that Doppler smearing that we see in the near field, near field sorry, and that will account for the angular difference seen by these different telescopes. Better yet, I'm making it run in the background of the telescope's regularly scheduled space observations so we don't have to interrupt anyone's work. And if we can do all this in real time, then we can have radio telescopes made for astronomy that should be comparable to a dedicated space tracking radar in its performance at tracking space debris. In this way, we can use instruments we already have and data we're already collecting to save billions of dollars in tackling this global crisis and to ensure that future generations still have access to space. Thank you. Thank you, Mars. We now have our two minutes of question time. And please welcome Dr. Vanessa Moss to ask the question. Hi, Mars. Uh, thank you for your talk and the really interesting work you're doing. Uh, so my question is, how easy will it be to take the same kind of commensal backend that you've described and apply it to telescopes other than the ATCA? 
Well, we know that the systems that I'm making are currently interleaving with the plans to upgrade the back end of ACCA, which is something that pre-existed my plans. We've seen VLBI telescopes, which are radio telescopes around the world, which I'm sure you know this, which is for the audience benefit, uh, that work can be used together to emulate a larger telescope. So they need to talk, talk to each other. And those have typically run off hardware-based systems, basically FPGAs, and more and more as we're getting up against the limits of our compute capabilities, we're switching to GPUs. And so that, that's the modern supercomputer right there. It's just banks of GPUs that we've strapped together. And basically, almost every observatory you speak to nowadays is being either newly built or being upgraded at any point is going to want to move to those consumer GPUs and banks. So we know that if we're writing something for consumer GPUs, say NVIDIA GPUs with the CUDA frameworks, then that's gonna be pretty transportable. There's always some hardware specific configurations, but this is more of a proof of concept for the approach. And they're always very capable people that work at all these different telescopes who work to adapt any kind of tool that they need to integrate there. But in another way, that proof of concept of the architecture itself could also be applied to other problems, not just other telescopes. If we have that pipeline, they can take in data from the telescope and perform additional processing without slowing down the main pipeline for astronomical instrumentation. Then we could apply it to things like geodesy or the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. If we're just piping that data to other places and performing other analysis, then we're just basically doubling the, the benefits of potentially of our telescope time, which we know is, is probably the most bottlenecked resource in that process. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Mars. Thank we have you. reached our two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we continue with our third presenter, Shanal Kurup from the Australian Catholic University. Over to you, Shanal. Hi, everyone. Australia has 35.3% of internationally qualified nurses contributing to the nursing workforce. Globally, we need 9 million more nurses by 2030 to achieve the UN Sustainable Health and Wellbeing Goal. So does the nurses live happily ever after following immigration? The answer is no. So when a nurse moves between international borders, the receiving country gains in terms of human resources and economic development. But the individual nurse who immigrate is met with a big brick wall of specialty skill underutilization. Specialty skill in nursing are a set of skills which makes a cardiac or a heart nurse different from a beauty therapy nurse. So currently, when an internationally qualified nurse arrives in a new country, there is no standard specialty skill transition model. They get a registration as a generalist nurse, irrespective of their experience. They might or might not get a job in the area of expertise. It's a total luck game. On an average, a nurse loses 15 years in terms of career progression when they immigrate. 15 years. When their skills are not used, nurses feel unvalued, dissatisfied, and they leave the workplace, the profession, or maybe the country. So what is the big idea? My research collected lived experience data from international nurses and their managers. And based on it, I'm suggesting a strength-based skill transition model. So what does that mean? An individualized transition model, which utilizes these nurses' strength or the specialty skills. In my model, there are three steps. Step number one, the assessing body, which is ANMAC in Australia, NMC in UK, and so on, will categorize these nurses to specialty nurse or generalized nurse based on their skills and experience. In step number two, based on the data from the assessing body, the nurse's first employer in the developed country matches the skills and employs these nurses in the right specialty. In step number three, if required, the first employer in conjunction, in conjunction with an education institution or university offers a strength-based gap training to support the specialty skill transition. And if we use this model, what could be the result? A happy nurse who knows what they're doing which will in turn reverse attrition among internationally qualified nurses. So if money excites you, this model saves billions of dollars spent on recruitment. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Shan Shao. Thanks, Hans. Now, over for our questions, please welcome Professor Lynn Beasley to ask Shan Shao a question. Lynn. Thank you, Chan Shao. I really enjoyed that presentation. I think you're addressing a very important issue. My question is, 
is this a broader problem? Do you think you could apply the same techniques for something such as engineering, where we're certainly wanting to get more engineers and certainly more women into the profession? Correct. It is actually a very broader problem. Uh, what I looked at is just nursing. But when I was trying to gather the data, I was getting from everywhere, like engineers, uh, doctors, um, all other different professionals who were coming to Australia or any other country, and they are normally met with a brick wall. But I don't know much about their details, their assessment body, all those kind of things. But once I start in nursing, maybe I'll be able to inform them, I believe. Yes. I think you've got a, you've hit on something really important there. Thank you. May I ask Dr. Michael Schütz to ask a brief second question? Greg Michanao, excellent. As a health professional, this topic is very close to my heart for many good reasons. Why your suggested model strengthened the integration of skilled nurses in healthcare system? Does it also contribute to the global shortage of nurses? Sorry. Um, uh, so using it, does that contribute to the global shortage or? Does it also contribute to reduce the shortage of yes, nurses yes, globally? Yes, yes, yes. The reason is um, if, um, so the specialty skill utilization uh, barrier, what I have uh, noticed is some nurses come to Australia and they are not working as nurses at all. They're working as something else. It's not my uh, the focus of my project, but still, that's also happening here because of the difficulties in translating their skill here. So uh, what happens is when they see in the immigration department, there is a vacancy that, okay, in Australia, there is uh, 200,000 nurses needed. They apply and they come to Australia. If the qualification is not recognized here, literally it is brain, brain drain, but brain not being utilized. So essentially the nurses are coming here, they're not practicing. So the uh, they, the um, nurse scarcity is still a problem. Nurses are coming in, though. Okay, many thanks, Shana. Thank you, Shao, and thank you, jury members. Now, our fourth presentation comes from Martino Malerba from Deakin University. Over to you. This is a fountain, and it looks as if it was having a rainy day. Except what you're seeing here are not raindrops, they are methane bubbles. Water in fountains is polluted with fertilizers and livestock manure, and this creates the perfect conditions for methane production. And methane is among the most potent climate change gas. This gas is like 30 to 50 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. In the last 100 years, Methane concentrations in the atmosphere have tripled, mostly because emissions from agriculture, such as farm dumps. Farm dumps are like chimneys. They are constantly pumping out methane, and there are a lot of them. For example, in Australia, there are 1.76 million farm dumps, together occupying nearly 5,000 square kilometers. We estimate farm dumps emit around 10% of all methane in agriculture, except Emissions from farm dumps are hidden. We don't know where they are, we don't account for them, and we don't report them. So in my research, I break the wall of these hidden carbon emissions from farm dumps. And how do I do that? With a simple fence. My research found that building a fence around a farm dump on average reduces methane emissions by 56%. That's right, that's more than half. This is because fences stop livestock from peeing and pooing in the water and help plants to grow and act as a biofilter to keep good water quality. And cleaner water means fewer methane bubbles. My solution is new and is something extraordinary. It is simple and we can act on it today. We have the science to tell us what to do. We have the farmers who benefit from having better dumps. And we even have ways to organize financial incentives to help farmers to take action. I'm working with the Australian government so that farmers can be rewarded with carbon credits whenever they invest to reduce emissions from farm dumps. This research could make Australia the first country in the world to tackle uh, pollution from farm dumps and lead the way for other nations to follow. I know what you're thinking. Fencing farm dumps won't solve climate change. 
Climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. Yet, this simple solution can have massive benefits on reducing our carbon footprint. Thank you, Martino. Now to our questions, and I'd like to welcome Craig Handy to start with questions. Craig. Thank you, Martina. Fascinating, fascinating research into agriculture, which is certainly an important industry here in Australia. I'm curious, if methane emissions from dams is not recorded, tracked and accounted for, as you, as you tell us in your presentation, how do you calculate that it represents 10% of agricultural emissions? Yeah, great question. So these estimates are first estimates and they're based on the work that we are doing in um, at the University in the Blue Carbon Lab. And so uh, uh, we, we have uncertainty around it and uh, this is our best guess, but definitely there is a lot more uh, that needs to be done in this space. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Craig. May I ask Lynn Beasley to ask the second question of Martina? Craig, I thought this is really interesting. I wanted to ask you, as well as reducing the methane levels, is your approach going to increase the overall health of our waterways and particularly support biodiversity in them? Yeah, indeed. So managing farm dams have lots of co-benefits that go well beyond the, the carbon footprint. By increasing vegetation, as you mentioned, you increase biodiversity and you turn farm dumps into oases um, where you can support the native wildlife, as well as you improve water quality, which will benefit on the health of livestock, as well as we have also preliminary evidence showing that they will improve water security by reducing evaporation and cooling the water. So plenty of benefits. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martino. Thank you, jury members. As you can see, this is a very fast paced um, sequence of events and presentations. And there are many terrific ideas already here and to come. So our fifth presenter, Daniel Lee from Griffith University. Let me start by asking you, have we all seen more grown food? Now, what if I told you we breathe in mold every day? The fungi I'd like to introduce to you is Aspergillus. We breathe in these fungi through our lungs every day and can cause a variety of diseases from simple allergic reactions to life-threatening invasive diseases like invasive aspergillosis. This is when the fungal infection spreads into blood and therefore other parts of the body, including the brain. Have I scared anyone yet? Before you stress, let me assure you, most of us are protected by our own immune system. It's only when the immune system is compromised, aspergillus has the potential to cause an invasive disease. Nevertheless, fungal infections affect more than 1 billion people worldwide with more than 1.7 million deaths annually. This is much higher than the reported death due to the well um, reported death of the well-known and talked about influenza. It has also costed the Australian economy more than half a billion dollars in hospitalization alone, or up to $81,000 per case of invasive fungal infections. To make matters worse, not only does this affect humans, but it is a growing issue in farming and in poultry, where the only option is to cull the entire flock. However, as deadly as fungal infections are, it is a neglected area of research. Currently, there's only a limited number of antifungals available with resistance highly reported. But We've not seen a new antifungal on the market for over a decade. So this is where my PhD project comes in. My project looks to discover and develop a new antifungal to combat this issue. To do this, I target a vital component of the fungal cell, galactomannan, or the sword that helps keep fungi alive and effect. Think of this sword as the fungi's attack and defense mechanism. Without galactomannan, the fungal cell is malformed and therefore they are unable to attack, defend, and they die, like this fella here with the broken sword. My project looks to develop a new compound that will block or break the production of galactomannan or the machineries within the fungi that make these swords. And this is done by following our innovative drug discovery pipeline. It involves screening up to half a million compounds virtually to find ones that will fit in and inhibit these machineries. Once found, they're tested extensively on fungi to test the antifungal potentials and in human cells and animal models for safety and preclinical testing. 
Excitingly, within the first two years of my PhD, I have identified three candidates showing strong antifungal activity and safety in human and chicken cells. So currently we're in the process to patent this amazing step forward. Three novel antifungals to finally provide a solution. A bulldozer to break down the walls of antifungal resistance and to break down the walls of patient suffering to give them or you the quality of life one truly deserves. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. Now, let's start our two minutes of questions and answers. Please welcome Rosie Hicks to start it off. Thank you, Danielle. An excellent presentation, appropriately exciting and scary. Uh, you mentioned that there hasn't been a new antifungal resistance treatment on the, brought to the market for a decade. Um, and yet you've made some really excellent progress here. Can you tell us why uh, this has been an under-researched under area? Yep, sure. Um, so generally with the um, health environment at the moment, the main concern that has been targeted is antibiotics because it is um, a more broadly used area of drugs um, and fungal infections are just something that not much people know about. And all they know is, oh, I can go to the chemist and just get a particular medication. And it's it's just an uh, area that no one has actually thought because it's not as, as um, mainly talked about in the media or in the health field. No one's actually looked at it. Um, if you look at the CDC from America, they don't actually look at this particular target as much as they do with the other health concerns in the world. So they've only just begun to look at um, monitoring the fungal infections that are around the world because they just saw the seriousness. So you would have seen with the COVID hitting um, the candida aureus in India with the black mold, things like that are now bringing up more, um, more attention to the fungal infections because no one's really talked about it or looked at it. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, it is a target that hasn't been looked at, but hopefully it will get the same look as people were talking about antibiotic resistance, and now they'll, they'll talk about antifungal resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Danielle, for such a complete and, uh, you know, complete answer for a deep question. So thank you, and we will be moving on in our ever-changing program to our sixth presenter. Now we'll have Fiona Harshini, Roy Desmond Godfrey from Monash University. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Fiona from Monash University. My topic is decarbonizing the planet. The global energy demand is increasing with population growth. The global energy generation is mostly relying on oil, gas, and coal, contributing more than 75% of global energy demand. So the burning of oil, gas, and coal is one of the largest segment of CO2 level that we have today. CO2 level in the atmosphere is peaking up. So now we must act on climate change for our future generation. To become fossil free, reduce CO2 emission and reverse climate change, we need a more sustainable and renewable energy resource that must be continuously produced regardless of sun or wind. And there is one just beneath our feet. So that is geothermal clean power. Just 1% energy is enough to supply the energy demand of the world more than 25,000 years. We can generate this clean power with enhanced geothermal system. Here we are injecting cool water through a well to extract heat from hot rock body, so which is just four to five kilometer deep. Then the heat is transferred into electricity. Most industries are using water for fracking. Hydrofracking has bad public perceptions. Many places ban this technology as well. Then why we are using water? What are the challenges associated with water? For a single fracturing, it needs million gallons of water, which induces seismic activity as well. More chemicals are used. So Australia is the driest country. We need to save the water. 
then is there any alternative to water? Absolutely, yes. We can use carbon dioxide as the fracking and circulating fluid. Our preliminary studies shows that carbon dioxide is superior to water because the production is 10 times higher than that of water. No seismic activity. We can store a huge amount of geological storage of CO2. Finally, we have a good energy resource. We are contributing net zero emission target as well. By using this technology, we can power the world, including African countries. They haven't enough resource to generate electricity. By using this technology, they can generate clean and continuous electricity. They can use this technology for agricultural purpose. They can plant crops so they can reduce the hunger. So we are, we are contributing UN sustainability goals as well. So finally, we have good, clean, sustainable energy resource. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Now let me please welcome Dr. Dr. Hilary Howe to ask Fiona the first question. Thank you. Um, fantastic presentation and really important topic. Uh, I'm glad you're working on it. I found I didn't quite understand the connection you were making between foam-based fracturing and agriculture specifically. Could you could you explain it in a little more detail? Yeah, of course, it's a great question. So conventionally, uh, for the fracking, water is used in the oil and gas industry. For we need a replacement for the water. So foam means it's a combination of gas plus water. In the gas, we are thought to use CO2. So we can reduce the CO2. So with a combination of uh, water and gas, we can create a foam. So instead of water, instead of pure CO2, we can inject foam for the fracking. So that time we can get more benefit than pure water. Thank you. We have time for a second question. May I ask Rosie Hicks to follow up, please? Thanks very much, Fiona. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, potential for geothermal energy is being recognised, uh, but it's a long pathway through to translation here in Australia. What's the next step for translation of your work? Uh, at, at the moment, the fracking process is banned in Australia. So uh, we need to find a good solution for that. So we are working on that. If we prove that uh, by using fracturing, we can reduce seismic activity, we can reduce the bad things about the fracking technology, we can absolutely uh, move to the second, that means the preliminary field implication studies. Now we are on the laboratory scale studies. Likewise, we have to transfer this laboratory studies to the field study. That is the next level of our target. Lovely. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you all. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you, Jury, for these question and answers. Now, let me continue. And please welcome our seventh presenter, Marin Fraser from the Australian National University. The legend of the Trojan War was set 3,000 years ago, an epic tale where a decade-long struggle ended with the Greeks sailing away, seemingly defeated, leaving behind a wooden horse. But the Trojan victory was short-lived as they pulled their trophy in through the city walls, unaware that their enemies lay hidden inside. I'm not a historian, but I'm working on a much older war where the Trojan horse may again prove useful. I'm talking about the struggle between humans and malaria parasites, a war that has raged on for the entirety of human history. These tiny parasites have killed billions of humans, though with significant medical advancements, we seem to be coming out on top. But in recent years, our human death toll has risen, in part because our best weapons our frontline treatments are less effective than they used to be since the parasites have evolved drug resistance to overcome our advances. We need new ways to target them. And so I'm looking back to ancient Greek legends for some fresh ideas. Now, 
First, we need to understand our enemies and identify their weak spots. Well, malaria parasites love cholesterol, but they just can't make this delicious treat for themselves. So they steal it from our blood. Now we could try and stop this thievery or maybe take some Trojan inspiration. So usually we would knock down the wall, but I wanted something that they would wave on through. So we hit a drug in with the cholesterol, hoping it would sneak in under the guise of a tasty treat. Using this strategy, I fooled the parasites who happily took our poisoned food inside. This meant that the disguised drug was much better at killing the parasites. And our strategy worked against multiple branches of the parasites' army, the spies in the liver, the soldiers in the blood, the scouts ready to seek out a new victim, and even those smart resistant parasites which had already evolved ways to avoid the normal drug. They were all tricked when we hit it in the horse. But these parasites live in our body, so we don't want collateral damage. I'm pleased to say that our human cells were a lot smarter than the parasites and left the horse outside. The compound was far less toxic to our cells. So we're breaking down the wall of drug-resistant malaria and reducing the impact on our own side, all under the guise of a friendly wooden horse slipping in through the city walls. Thank you, Marin. Thank you. Now let's uh, switch over to the question and answers. And I would like to ask Michael Schutz to start it off. Marin, great performance. I love it. Now, while this concept seems great, how far has your research proven that this Trojan concept is successful? So at the moment, we're only working sort of in the lab environment. So we're testing it against lots of different life cycle stages of the parasites because malaria parasites are really complicated. They've got, as I said, stages that live in the liver, in the blood, different stages that are used for transmission. And so we're testing this compound against all of these different stages because we think that the thing that unites these very different uh, aspects of the life cycle is that they all rely on cholesterol. So because there's so many different aspects, we've mostly been um, just focusing on kind of what are the potential applications, but we have also tested it against some totally different parasites that cause different diseases. And we do have some promising results there as well. So we're not yet at the stage where we're looking at moving it into an actual body, but we're doing the preliminary work such as testing whether the compounds remain stable when they're in solutions that are like blood so that we can make sure that by the time we actually get to putting it into a real body, um, that we know that we're not going to run into problems with uh, compound stability and that kind of thing. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. May I ask Lynn, Lynn Beasley, to follow up with a quick question and a quick answer. Yes, Merrin, thank you so much. My quick question is, and I think you've partially addressed it, can we apply this to other examples of drug resistance? Absolutely. I mean, well, our research so far has only focused on kind of a narrow set of parasites, but most parasites and particularly ones that are closely related to the malaria parasite do rely on cholesterol. So we think that it could be applicable to a huge range of potential diseases of both humans and animals. So there's medical uh, importance there as well as agricultural importance. Thank you. Thank you, Marin, Lynn and Michael. Thank you for the dialogue. So let's please welcome our eighth presenter, Nipuni Pefafa Sandwich. Over to you, Nipuni. In the next 40 years, we need to produce the same amount of food as we have done in the last 8,000 years. This is a huge challenge due to growing global population, climate crisis, and with the limited resources. How do we secure our food production? The real secret is sustainable production. By the end of this presentation, I'm not promising you a silver bullet. However, I'm going to give you a viable option for increasing crop production in a sustainable manner. Biotic and abiotic stressors are significant threats for the future food production. 
the stressors such as salinity, drought, heat, UV, or pathogen, they all cause cell death. If we can block cell death, then we can block each one of those stressors. In the field, plants are getting multiple stressors simultaneously. For example, when the plant is in drought stress, pathogen comes and attack. Also, if we can develop crops with increased nitrogen and water use efficiencies, it will give us a lot of benefits, including improved stress tolerance levels, which will then lead to the future food security. But how can we do this? When cells are under stress, proteins do not fall properly and they become dysfunctional. It will then lead to the accumulation of unfolded proteins in the cells, which creates a toxic environment. Um, and one way cells get rid of this toxic compound is autophagy. Starvation diet is an example for this. Starvation diets have shown promising anti-aging properties because it removes toxic compounds from your cells. By the time you have your next meal, your cells have been cleansed of those toxic compounds because cells need fuel. So to restore that fuel, cells specifically target these unwanted compounds and degrade them to release the energy. So how can we translate that sort of technology to improve crops? We have done this using a single gene, which will produce a folding protein called BAG4. When we express this gene in chickpea, we observed not only drought tolerance, but also higher yield, higher nitrogen content, and higher photosynthesis levels. Our data showed that expression of a single gene could potentially increase both nitrogen and water use efficiencies in our GM chickpea. Biotechnologists always come up with a new gene and say it can produce a higher yield in a certain crop. But what is actually going doing it in the field? We have shown this in the field. Our field data showed that we got some promising results from our field trials. So having this knowledge as a foundation, can we develop non-GM gene edited stress tolerant crops to feed the world? Thank you. Thank you, Nipuni. Thank you. Now let's progress to the question and answers and please welcome back Mrs. Rosie Hicks to start it off. Thanks, Nipuni. That is such uh, an important area of research for us. The numbers are sobering. Um, there has been a lot of social license issues associated with GM crops. How are you going to navigate through that? Uh, what can be done to address these issues? Um, yes, thank you for the question. And um, so, yes, this is um, my research was basically to understand the mechanisms behind the bag four mediated stress tolerance. And the next thing will be that is GMO, GM, G, G, genetically modified uh, chickpea. But the next, what we are going to do is using gene editing technology. Um, how can we like manipulate uh, genome in the crops, not only chickpea, more broadening legumes? Um, to generate non-GM non um, crop varieties. So yes, you're correct. That is GM ones are not allowed. So the mechanisms was identified. So the next thing will be in the future, uh, how can we translate that sort of knowledge, knowledge to generate non-GM non uh, crops? Thank you. Puni. May I ask Craig Pandy to follow up, please? Thank you, Nipuni. Really exciting research. Food security is such an important issue as we're seeing in Sri Lanka at the moment. I'm interested to know your research. How does this differ from other GM technologies in either its application or the outcome that you're seeking to achieve? Um, other, uh, this was uh, our research was uh, over expression of this gene in chickpea. So the next thing that is certainly a GM 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 chickpea. So the next thing um, will be like um, have, we are not going to insert um, foreign gene into the into the, into a crop. What we are going to do is um, using CRISPR-Cas9 or any other G, gene gene editing 
tool, we are going to uh, modify the BAG4 gene or BAG4 or whatever the gene, which gives the stress tolerance levels in crops. Okay. Okay. So if I could just, I, I think I understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Craig. Thank you, Rosie. And most of all, thank you, Nipuni, for the dialogue. Now, in our program, we come to our ninth presenter, and we will have now Oliver Lotz from the University of Sydney. Imagine that in one hand, I have a beating human heart. Any volunteers? while on the other, I have an artificial replica made of mostly plastic. If I were to ask you which is more likely to work inside a patient, then all of you would probably vote for the real heart. The question is why? This is an important question because the waiting list for organ transplants can take years if you survive that long, and the number of organ replacements needed is likely to increase dramatically in the near future, thanks to an aging population. This is really a question of bioactivity. Can we communicate with cells in the ways that they understand? Medical devices are good and getting better, at uh, showing relevant architecture, stiffness and roughness, physical cues, but we're still missing the biomolecules. Cells see a world not just full of biomolecules, but made of them. They help cells live, grow and transform. If we could control bioactivity, then it's game on for a range of new healthcare treatments. For example, stem cell uh, treatments uh, need incubators that help cells sorry, that make cells want to grow. Organ models need to, be real, need to be realistic to be relevant for drug testing. And medical devices need a guarantee that they won't get rejected. Current methods to introduce bioactivity typically use chemicals. These methods risk toxicity for patients, are slow and can't even pattern. When they don't use chemicals, typically the bonds aren't strong enough to keep the biomolecules where they need to be. My research is about developing a tool that will help us get the best of all worlds quick targeted surface treatments for bioactivity. I use plasma in open air, not blood plasma, physics plasma, the fourth state of matter. This tool is like a torch or a pen and can be an extra head in a bioprinter. Uh, no other lab is using this approach yet. I've attached a range of biomolecules and investigated the mechanisms for how this works. And the scaffolds that I've treated with my plasma pen help cells grow more easily. This is an important step to creating realistic tissue. So if that were an organ, the patient's body would be a lot happier to have it. Uh, my collaborators and I are showing that this works uh, on, uh, sorry, for real applications. For example, cartilage for knee replacements. Knees are not very good at repairing themselves. So a bioprinting solution would be a big boost in quality of life for a whole range of people. Our results to date show we can grow cartilage better than the current gold standard. Next up, it's time to get this technology to market with the world-class bioprinting company that I'm working with. To summarize, I'm developing this plasma pen tool for bioprinters so that when you get sick and your body needs one of these two, can't tell the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. And let's start the Q&A and please let me welcome back Dr. Hilary Howe to start it off. Thank you, Oliver. I can certainly see a lot of applications for the uh, technology that you're developing. Um, I guess I'm curious to know how you came up with the idea of using plasma rather than chemicals to introduce bioactivity. It seems like a very different approach, and I wonder what, what led you to think that it might work. So, uh, firstly, thank you. Um, so the, the group that I'm working with has been uh, using plasma with low pressure for uh, a number of years in order to treat and modify surfaces, uh, sometimes for medical applications, sometimes for a variety of others. So um, uh, the step that my work took was to do this at atmospheric pressure so that it'd be relevant for bioprinters. Um, so in that sense, uh, it, uh, it made sense for, for people who are already using plasma to apply it to this kind of um, technique. And it turns out that it's, uh, it's working quite well. Um, yeah, it wasn't first from the biomedical side. Please let me ask Dr. Vanessa Moss to follow up, please. 
Thanks. Uh, hi, Oliver. So actually, this this kind of follows on from what you just mentioned about like the history behind the method and the approach and the changes. So my question is, what other potential uses can you see your method being applied for in health or otherwise in society? Sure. So um, in the uh, in the video, I focused on artificial organs, but there's a variety of healthcare applications. So in terms of drug discovery or development um, and biosensors uh, and things that would boost quality of life in a variety of ways. But yes, there are um, other things as well. So, uh, for example, in terms of um, wastewater treatment, uh, attaching biomolecules can be very useful. Um, also in terms of food uh, production and refinement. So in terms of, say, treating milk or, or those kinds of things, um, attaching biomolecules to filters and things can be quite useful, um, as well as uh, avoiding spoilage so uh, biomolecules can be used as, as sensors to tell when something goes off so that can help um, you know us get the most out of the food that we produce um, so yeah there's, there's a variety of ways this could be used thank you thank you oliver for the nice dialogue and the complete answers so we'll now continue our program with the last but not least presentation. And now we have Clara Young from the University of Queensland. Over to you. Depression affects over 200 million people globally, and new pharmacological treatments are much needed. However, on average, it costs over $1 billion and takes 10 years to make a new drug from scratch and to get it approved for market use. Even then, 90% of the drugs fail during clinical trials due to safety or efficacy related reasons. And this creates a major barrier to developing the new treatments that depression patients desperately need. Here, we propose a potential solution to breaking down this barrier, where instead of making new drugs, we thought, why not repurpose some of the drugs that we already have to save time and money? And the approach we take to explore the repurposing potential of our existing drugs is very similar to fingerprint matching. Here, we look for similarities in the fingerprints of our drug candidates and existing antidepressants that we know to be effective. And in this case, their fingerprints are the gene expression changes that these drugs induce in human cells. Just like how the fingerprint of a person can indicate their identity, the gene expression signature of a drug can also provide insights into their pharmacological effects on a molecular level. Let me illustrate with an example. Our search so far has identified statins to be a candidate that can be potentially repurposed for treating depression. Statins are medications that lower cholesterol levels and are widely used for treating cardiovascular diseases, so we know that they are safe. Using the drug fingerprint matching analysis, we find that statins and antidepressants show highly similar gene expression fingerprints, indicating potentially similar pharmacological effects. We then look more closely at the genes linked to, to this similarity and find that many of them play a role in immune processes. From this, we speculate that statins can potentially exhibit antidepressive effects by influencing our immune system, which has been shown to go haywire in depression. Our analysis first provides justification for future clinical trials looking at statins as a potential treatment for depression. Using this drug fingerprint matching approach, we can potentially find more existing drugs that we know to be safe and explore their new therapeutic values in treating depression. Our approach can also help prioritize gene candidate, uh, drug candidates that are worth pursuing in downstream clinical trials. This way, we can potentially get new treatments to the patients in a fraction of the time that is required by conventional drug discovery approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Thank you. Now let's have our customary two minutes question and answer. And I would like to welcome back Lynn Beasley to start it off. Clara, thank you for that excellent presentation. Repurposing drugs, I think it's a terrific idea. Now you've chosen statin and we know a lot of people are taking statins long term for a completely different reason. So is there any evidence that these people have lower rates of depression? 
That's an excellent question. So we have the evidence from observational studies uh, showing that um, users of statins had a lower rate of depression. But of, of course, um, observational studies often report conflicting evidence. So we have also looked at evidence from randomized control trials, which are considered the gold standards. And some of them do report a beneficial effect of statins when used as a um, additional treatment to current antidepressants. So um, yeah, as you said, many people are taking statins for various reasons, mostly for preventing and treating cardiovascular diseases. So it's understanding the effect of statins on depression is not only potentially beneficial for drug repurposing, but it's also very important because we certainly don't want medications that are meant to you know, treat one disease to worsen, potentially worsen another kind of disease. Thank you. Wonderful. Two for the price of one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let me ask Dr. Michael Schutz to follow up with a second question, please. Michael? Thanks, Clara. I think the initial reason to start your project is, applies to other areas as well. And for that reason, the question is, would this approach to steer the antidepressant drug development only limited to this medical condition? Or is there also scope to broaden the application for this approach to other drug developments? That's an excellent question. So the resource that we are using at the moment is called the Connectivity Map Database, which has hundreds of thousands of drug-induced fingerprints. And that will allow us to look at a diverse range of drugs, as well as their effect on a diverse range of diseases. So we can not only apply this fingerprint matching analysis to you know, the similarity between drugs, we can also use uh, directly use the fingerprints of diseases. So that would be the genes that are you know, upregulated or downregulated in a disease, and we can directly directly pipe that through our um, drug fingerprint analysis and identify drugs that could counteract the effect of the drug, uh, sorry, the disease fingerprints. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, thank you, Clara. Thank you, Lynn and Michael. Now, I find this is a wonderful set of ideas. I have no idea which one is the best, but that's what we have a jury for. But before we go there, maybe we can't hear your audience, but I hope you're still all out there. So let's have a round of applause for all 10 of them, even if it just goes into nowhere. Fantastic work. Okay. Now, the jury will now withdraw into their private room. They will have 20 minutes, so they will be back fairly soon to announce who is going to be the winner, who will be Team Australia to represent us in Berlin as part of Falling Walls in November. The top winners will uh, receive a package organized by the DADAD, which includes the travel expenses, the chance to join the Innovation Week and program following the conference. The UXS will provide high quality online communication training for the free windows led by the European experts. And that will include the opportunity for one in one consultation. And also the German embassy is providing financial support for travel accommodation and for the winners when they're in Berlin. So let's thank you all our generous sponsors and people who support this event. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, all out there, please enjoy some fascinating signs. Thank you. I think an event of this kind is a stepping stone for the young scientists who, when they come here, get some recognition for what they are doing and also are able to form networks. Falling Walls Lab is unique because we have 75 young people presenting their idea. Falling Walls is about the most pressing challenges of our time, creating innovative solutions. I want to make science accessible to every single person in this world because the science is there to help humanity and humanity must understand what it is that we're researching. Participation for me 
means understanding my own work better, gaining the skills to present in these sorts of high profile environments with the best equipment and the best people in the world. The opportunities the Falling Walls gave to us to really put the ideas out and really make a change in the world really appealed to me and that's how I reached there. To me, it's really the breadth of ideas, the breadth of across the scientific disciplines. We've faced very large challenges and Falling Walls is a place full of hope on so many levels. Climate change is one of our biggest challenges, but science exists to overcome challenges. So here are some of the year's top innovations in the battle against global warming. There is some amazing work taking place right around the world, but let's begin in Madagascar. Malagasy forest is under serious threats due to the fast growing deforestation, mainly caused by bushfire and charcoal production. Dr. Pascal Safid has designed a machine that creates bio briquettes, a biofuel substitute made from grass that can replace charcoal and coal. The idea is to take the grass and press them by using a press machine to get bio briquettes. Indeed, grass is renewable and regenerate faster than trees. The grass powder will be compacted by applying a high pressure with a press machine. Then we get the bio briquettes. These little grass pellets can be used to boil water and create steam energy, propel turbines for electricity, and even heat homes. Now we already know we need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, but what about the carbon dioxide that we've already released into the atmosphere? It's gonna be up there floating around for hundreds of years. In other words, how do we regain control of our planet's thermostat? One answer to that can be found in our oceans. Australia's Professor Peter McCready is zoning in on how they draw down carbon. In particular, seagrass meadows, tidal marshes and mangrove forests and also seaweeds, they only occupy about 1% of the sea floor, yet they sequester more than half the ocean's carbon. And they lock that carbon down for thousands of years. So Peter McCready says the evidence is clear. The world should now be protecting so-called blue carbon sites. To Germany now, where Professor Frank Dimroth is trying to get more value from the sun. Now, what we believe is that solar energy will be the primary energy technology in the future. We all know that we have to go into a conversion from fossil fuels into renewable energies for establishing a more sustainable society. Creating energy from sunlight isn't a new idea, but standard solar cells can only convert light of a limited wavelength range, while other regions of the sun spectrum are hardly used, if at all. What we are trying to do is to use several materials which match much better to the different wavelength in the solar spectrum. We call these tandem solar cells or multi-junction solar cells. And the materials which we are adding to the silicon are, for example, 3,5 compounds. An example would be gallium arsenide. And very new material where a lot of people are performing research today is the so-called perovskites. Both of these material systems have shown that we can very significantly increase conversion efficiency by combining these new materials with the conventional silicon used in today's photovoltaics. And that could improve the efficiency of solar cells even further, helping the world make the jump to renewables, provided that society can ensure the current generation of lead perovskites does not introduce another kind of environmental hazard. Can you imagine a world without waste? Well, Maybe not, but perhaps we can rethink how that waste is made. That was the approach taken by Andrea Ling, who recognised her own part in the problem. My response was to recognise as an architect and a designer, um, all I do is create waste or what will be waste. Um, and so if that's the case, then I need to design waste as nature does. You heard right, she designs waste intentionally. That waste incorporates natural biological decay in its fabrication process, using enzymes and microbes that are built into the materials, allowing the biomaterials and bioplastics to self-decompose under the right conditions, thereby reducing our waste output. My base material system included biocomposites of chitin, cellulose and pectin, derived from the exoskeletons of shrimp, 
tree pulp waste and fruit skins. And that's the kind of thinking the world needs right now. You can read more about these innovations and many others by heading to the website now on your screen. I suspect they'll give you as much hope as they gave me. I'm Nula Havener. See you next time on Global Science. Remember to hit subscribe for our regular videos. And while you're here, check out our past episodes. Wireless medical robots personalise cancer vaccines and heart valve replacements for children. Just some of this year's standout medical innovations pitched during the Falling Walls and Berlin Science Week World Science Summit. More than 900 nominations from 111 countries. It seems the global pandemic hasn't slowed big thinking from some of our brightest minds. Across the next four weeks, I'm going to share my picks for the Falling Walls breakthroughs of the year from fields such as climate science, technology, social science, and first up, medical. Effective drug delivery to disease sites remains a major challenge in today's medicine. That's Professor Simone Schuler, who wants to improve the way drugs target specific parts of our bodies. Her secret weapon? Magnets. We are working with a special strain of bacteria that can sense magnetic fields. When the researchers put the bacteria into a microfluidic system and then applied rotating magnetic fields in various orientations, the bacteria followed, pulling along any nearby nanoparticles. In fact, the nanoparticles were pushed into model tissue three times faster than when magnets weren't used. Another part that has been bugging me was actually how we could more selectively apply these rotational magnetic fields at a human scale. And this is something I've been working on with my team recently and we came up with a design, but we haven't built it yet. And so that is something I'm eager to explore. This next innovation makes use of magnets too, but was inspired by small soft bodied animals. Our dream has been creating tiny medical machines that can operate inside our body all the time for medical diagnostics and treatment. Professor Martin City says his little robot can do just about anything. We design and build a new soft robot that is in this mini size scale that has a very special program micromagnet inside and then uh, we can have all different locomotion modalities like walking, rolling, jumping, swimming and going on the water surface type of behavior for the first time on the same robot. And with such flexibility, it could be programmed for things as complex as drug delivery, fluid pumping, and, and even liquid biopsies. The robots aren't ready yet. The researchers are tackling all types of challenges, especially from our immune system, but the results are promising. So watch this space. Next up, I want you to meet Associate Professor Michelle Manger, who's changing our understanding of brain tumors. The essential finding of my research is that brain cancers like glioblastoma and diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma interact with normal brain cells called neurons, and that these interactions are fundamental to the progression and growth of these cancers. In fact, cancer cells integrate into neural circuits. That leads to electrical currents flowing through the cancers. And what we find is this electrical signaling is really central to the tumor's ability to grow and invade. Knowing that has opened up entirely new directions in developing therapeutic strategies. Let's head to Helsinki now and the medical startup dressing up viruses to fool cancer. You know, one of the biggest challenge in cancer therapy is the fact that tumor originates from our own tissue. So for our immune system, that is actually the police that guards our body, it's very difficult to spot tumor. But immune systems do recognize viruses. They activate T cells to respond to foreign substances in the body. A few years ago, we had an idea. Why don't we take the tumor, we chop the tumor in small pieces, and then we load these small pieces on the surface of a virus? So the viruses are modified to carry tumor cell fragments that the immune system can recognize, acting almost like a vaccine. Keep an eye on virus therapy for cancers, many consider it the new frontier. Finally, to a breakthrough providing new hope to babies born with heart valve defects. The essential new finding of our research is that we have established a method to produce 
a heart valve from living tissue from the patient, him or herself. That means there is no rejection, there is no other tissue needed, there are no other materials needed. In Europe alone, around 1,200 heart valve transplants are performed on children each year. The mechanical heart valves normally used require lifelong blood thinning treatments and are susceptible to infections. So we want to bring the solution of a baby, of a child heart valve to the market. We will produce a growing heart valve, which is implanted once and stays in for a lifetime so that there's no resurgery needed. Brilliant, right? So they're just some of my favorite medical innovations of the year. You can learn more about them and many other amazing breakthroughs by registering for the World Science Summit, bringing together Falling Walls Remote 2020 and the Berlin Science Week. You'll find the link in the social post. And make sure you stay across Global Science TV in coming weeks for innovations in tech, climate and social sciences. Trust me, they're worth seeing. I'm Nilla Hafner, chat soon. Remember to hit subscribe for our regular videos. And while you're here, check out our past episodes. Australia has said it aims to cut its carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. And this joins other countries around the world in promising to make the nation carbon neutral by then. The real issue is how, and our answer is technology. Technology will have the answers to a decarbonised economy. But what kind of technology? I don't think there is one silver bullet. Professor Thomas Mashmeyer was awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science in 2020 for his work on renewable energy and plastic waste recycling. He says while there's been plenty of talk about things such as carbon capture, the biggest game changer has been the rapidly falling price of solar energy. What other thing has decreased in price by 95% over a period of 10 years? That is enabling as input a whole lot of other technologies. That includes energy storage, such as his own battery creation, G-Lion, which thanks to its zinc bromide composition, can work in tough environments, such as agricultural or remote communities. But G-Lion can also support the deployment of another emerging technology, green hydrogen. Our batteries are a natural partner for solar battery electrolyzer to generate the green hydrogen. Most of the buzz around green hydrogen has centred on electric cars and trucks, but it can also be used to replace coal in steel refineries. Swapping out coal to make steel is something Professor Vina Sahajwala is already doing at UNSW. Our green steel technology is all about showing that we can actually use materials like waste tyres in the process of making steel. Her polymer injection technology, which extracts hydrogen and solid carbon from old tyres, has been used in the production of more than 30 million tonnes of steel around the world. Professor Sahajwala is now even experimenting with using waste coffee as a source of carbon. Traditionally, of course, the world always thinks that you need coal and coke to produce these metals. And what we are doing is completely shifting the mindset and saying that the production of green materials is absolutely possible in a way that it not only enables us to recycle our materials, but also enables us to bring green manufacturing to life anywhere in the world using Australian science. But Professor Mashmeyer cautions that science takes time. You have the idea, you've got to patent the idea in some form, you've got to build the team, you've got to validate and verify whatever your mousetrap is. It also takes money, and Australia currently spends less on research and development as a proportion of GDP than the OECD average. There need to be an investment and a political framework. The settings of that framework will help to accelerate or decelerate progress. The Australian Academy of Science. Because questions need answers.
pandemics have increased in frequency in the last few hundred years, and it's an obvious reflection of the way humans live. We have bigger populations, we're more connected, we're more urban, we're, we're denser, we interact more with wildlife species, we have deforestation. So it's going to happen more. I think climate change is really going to be a, a key driver of this because as climates change, what will happen is that animals will change their distribution too because they're affected by climate change and they'll probably group together more, allowing viruses to jump more between them. Humans who rely on animal species will need to change their way of, their way of living, their, their livelihoods, their way of acquiring food, and they'll probably be exposed to new animal species and new pathogens too. So I think climate change and pandemics go hand in hand. Climate change will get more pandemics. If you look at people who live near wildlife, who work in animal markets or live, live near bat caves, they are very commonly exposed to viruses. It happens all the time. Even people in North America are very commonly exposed, for example, to, to swine flu viruses. Okay, So they're continually, people handle pigs, work in pig farms, go to pig fairs, but their pig viruses come to humans. So this exposure is happening all the time. Okay. Normally, luckily, they don't go anywhere. So there's one case and it burns itself out. Every so often though, and increasingly often now in this modern world, you get a chance for the virus to get going, cause an epidemic or even a pandemic. The Australian Academy of Science. Because questions need answers. this big cool competition that looks at research from young scientists all over the world who have the next big thing. I've created a piece of technology that can empower people to retrain their balance in their own homes before they have those falls. This is particularly for people who live in regional and remote areas and might not have access to the medical facilities that we have in big cities. I work on designing and fabricating implants that we can load with multiple different chemotherapy drugs um, to actually insert inside the tumour. Looking forward to the networking opportunities. The Australian Academy of Science. Follow our Facebook page. We tend to think of glass as a good guy of the packaging world. That's why we use it for the important things like beer and luxury water. Kudos to the organisers for organising the prop. And there's a good reason for this. I mean, sure, it takes a lot of energy to make it in the first place, but once it's made, it's, in theory, infinitely recyclable and, compared to plastics, relatively non-polluting. But there's a big problem with glass, or more specifically, there's a big problem with little pieces of glass in the glass supply chain. Because when you smash a bottle and it breaks into pieces that you can't sort into the right colour, we can only make green glass from green glass or brown glass from brown glass. And so when the pieces are too small, it can't be made into glass anymore. That destroys its value and it's not reused. And that's why more than half of all glass is not recycled. That's more than 60 million tonnes a year, enough to build a wall roughly a metre high, a metre wide and 40,000 kilometres long all the way around the equator. So what's the big idea? Well, when you look at the supply chain of glass, We've got the raw materials, energy goes in, it's made into a bottle, it's either recycled or not. It's very similar to this chemical, sodium silicate. Sodium silicate is one of the most widely used industrial chemicals in the world. We consume about 10 million tonnes of it a year and the global market's worth about $10 billion. It's used to make thousands of products, everything from tyres to detergents, silica gel and even toothpaste. And you probably see where this is going. During my PhD, I've developed a process to take glass, digest it in alkaline solution and separate it out into sodium silicate and a solid intermediate from which we can extract silica gel. 
And through 4,000 hours of optimization tests, which is about as fun as watching paint dry, I've actually managed to define the parameters where this can proceed in an economically um, viable way. And we've filed a patent to protect those and are going through the commercialization process. And that's what's exciting for me, because when we have glass that's currently going to landfill and we convert it into high purity silica, we take a product which is costing money and turn it into one that's worth more than $1,000 a tonne. And because we use the energy and raw materials which went into making glass in the first place, we can actually make sodium silicate at 50% of the cost of the conventional production route. Thank you. Astronomers think they may have found four exoplanets, or planets orbiting other suns beyond our solar system, using nothing more than low-frequency radio waves. The signals, from as far as 89 light-years away, were picked up by the world's largest ground-based radio telescope, the Low Frequency Array, and may shed light on the habitat of the exoplanets. Scientist Dr. Benjamin Pope says the team discovered signals from 19 distant red dwarf stars, four of which are best explained by the existence of planets orbiting them. Radio signals from those four stars seem to be emitted by their own spectacular light show, also called an aurora. Earth's aurorae form when particles from the sun collide with our planet's atmosphere. And on Jupiter, they also form from the planet's magnetic interaction with its moon, Io. The aurorae detected by the researchers indicate the presence of a hidden exoplanet, magnetically connected to its star, just as Io is to Jupiter. This means that they aren't shielded from any of their star's radioactive flares, making conditions on the surface too harsh for life. Co-author Dr. Joseph Callingham points out that Jupiter's volcanic moon blasts material out in space, filling Jupiter's environment with particles that drive unusually powerful aurorae. Our model for this radio emission from our stars is a scaled up version of that. Once the more powerful square kilometer array is functional in outback Australia, the technique could track aurorae even further away. The Australian Academy of Science, because questions need answers. Science matters to all of us. We're living in science. We're a world that's driven by science. A world without science would be a desolate sort of place. No technology, no electricity, no travel, no planes, no medicine. A good scientist is someone who can ask a really good question. Once you've answered it, it will have an impact on all sorts of other fields. With science, you're trying to uncover something no one else has ever managed to discover. I think the moment of discovery is a really interesting moment. The point where you realize that you're studying something that could be profoundly interesting and you can almost taste the discovery. It's the biggest buzz you can imagine, the aha moment. It's like, oh my God, we've got it. We live in a world of extraordinary challenges. The solutions to those challenges are more science and technology, not less. If the public have a deeper understanding of science, that allows them to make more informed choices about the way they live their lives, the way they interact with the planet and being healthier, which ultimately impacts their families and their communities. The future doesn't happen to us, we get to decide. Those decisions will be about how we best use technology and science to solve the very many problems that are facing us. 
We have come a really long way in scientific discovery and innovation over the last 100 years, even in the last decade. But there is still so much that we don't know. The beauty of the universe. Understanding the basic building blocks of life. The beauty of how things work. With science, you can solve problems. With science, you can make discoveries that none of us could ever have imagined. Every day, young sunflowers take part in a remarkable dance known as heliotropism. They trace the sun's movement across the sky, turning their faces from east to west. Then at night time, they twist their heads back towards the east in preparation for sunrise. That part in particular, we know is controlled by something called a circadian clock. This internal biological timekeeper that we have in our bodies, but it also exists in many different organisms, including plants. And that allows the plants to essentially know what time of day it is and, and predict important events like sunrise. This daily ritual is vital to plant survival. One study found that east-facing sunflowers attract about five times as many pollinators as west-facing ones during the early morning. That's partly because warmer sunflowers are better at producing and releasing pollen, while their increased exposure to sunlight also makes their colors or UV patterns more visible to insects like bees. Many flowers, including daisies and buttercups, are heliotropic. It's a trait that also increases photosynthesis in leaves, the process of how plants use sunlight, water and carbon dioxide to create oxygen and nutrients. The thing that drives plant growth is photosynthesis and that requires light. So by having the leaves move so that they capture as much sunlight as possible, that's going to increase their growth. But this dance doesn't last forever, at least not for sunflowers. Once these flowers have matured, they will settle on facing east to continue attracting pollinators. The Australian Academy of Science. Because questions need answers. Australia has said it aims to cut its carbon emissions to net zero by 2050. And this joins other countries around the world in promising to make the nation carbon neutral by then. The real issue is how, and our answer is technology. Technology will have the answers to a decarbonised economy. But what kind of technology? I don't think there is one silver bullet. Professor Thomas Mashmeyer was awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science in 2020 for his work on renewable energy and plastic waste recycling. He says while there's been plenty of talk about things such as carbon capture, the biggest game changer has been the rapidly falling price of solar energy. What other thing has decreased in price by 95% over a period of 10 years? That is enabling as input a whole lot of other technologies. That includes energy storage, such as his own battery creation, G-Lion, which thanks to its zinc bromide composition, can work in tough environments, such as agricultural or remote communities. But G-Lion can also support the deployment of another emerging technology, green hydrogen. Our batteries are a natural partner for solar battery electrolyzer to generate the green hydrogen. Most of the buzz around green hydrogen has centred on electric cars and trucks, but it can also be used to replace coal in steel refineries. Swapping out coal to make steel is something Professor Vina Sahajwala is already doing at UNSW. Our green steel technology is all about showing that we can actually use materials like waste tyres in the process of making steel. Her polymer injection technology, which extracts hydrogen and solid carbon from old tyres, has been used in the production of more than 30 million tonnes of steel around the world. 
Professor Sahajwala is now even experimenting with using waste coffee as a source of carbon. Traditionally, of course, the world always thinks that you need coal and coke to produce these metals. And what we are doing is completely shifting the mindset and saying that the production of green materials is absolutely possible in a way that it not only enables us to recycle our materials, but also enables us to bring green manufacturing to life anywhere in the world using Australian science. But Professor Mashmeyer cautions that science takes time. You have the idea, you've got to patent the idea in some form, you've got to build the team, you've got to validate and verify whatever your mousetrap is. It also takes money, and Australia currently spends less on research and development as a proportion of GDP than the OECD average. There need to be an investment and a political framework. The settings of that framework will help to accelerate or decelerate progress. The Australian Academy of Science. Because questions need answers. Pandemics have increased in frequency in the last few hundred years and it's an obvious reflection of the way humans live. We have bigger populations, we're more connected, we're more urban, we're denser, we interact more with wildlife species, we have deforestation. So it's going to happen more. I think climate change is really going to be a, a key driver of this because as climates change, what will happen is that animals will change their distribution too because they're affected by climate change and they'll probably group together more, allowing viruses to jump more between them. Humans who rely on animal species will need to change their way of, their way of living, their, their livelihoods, their way of acquiring food, and they'll probably be exposed to new animal species and new pathogens too. So I think climate change and pandemics go hand in hand. Climate change will get more pandemics. If you look at people who live near wildlife, who work in animal markets or live, live near bat caves, they are very commonly exposed to viruses. It happens all the time. Even people in North America are very commonly exposed, for example, to, to swine flu viruses. Okay, So they're continually, people handle pigs, work in pig farms, go to pig fairs, but their pig viruses come to humans. So this exposure is happening all the time. Okay. Normally, luckily, they don't go anywhere. So there's one case and it burns itself out. Every so often though, and increasingly often now in this modern world, you get a chance for the virus to get going, cause an epidemic or even a pandemic. The Australian Academy of Science. Because questions need answers. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, congratulations to all the finalists of the Falling Walls Lab Australia competition and to all the participants across the two heats who endeavored to submit their breaking the wall ideas. It might sound like a cliche, but all of you who have qualified for the final are winners because you have accepted the challenge of presenting your research in an accessible way and in such telling times. Effective science communication never was this critical as it is today. The true value of science can only be achieved when it is communicated, and hence, it is crucial that people know what is being done in the labs and how brilliant minds like you work to tear down the walls. I'm Nishant Sanile, Regional Coordinator for Euraxis Australia and New Zealand. Euraxis is an initiative of the European Commission that addresses barriers to the mobility of researchers and seeks to enhance scientific collaboration between Europe and the rest of the world. We provide free information about European research, credit opportunities, international collaboration, 
and networking possibilities. To all those who are watching us, if you are interested in European funding as a researcher, or if your institution would want to work on projects in collaboration with European research organizations, get in touch with your Access Australia and New Zealand and let us help you. Consistently to our philosophy of reducing barriers to scientific collaboration, we have decided on a long-term partnership with the Australian Academy of Science and the Embassy of Germany in Canberra, and that is to be involved with Falling Walls Lab in Australia. As a continuation of our commitment to this initiative, we were also happy to co-organize the Sydney Heat of Falling Walls Lab, as well as partner for the Brisbane Heat of the Falling Walls Lab. As a gesture of our appreciation for your hard work, we will invite the winners to do a virtual course in scientific communication with European trainers, and this will help you in preparing for the international contest in Berlin. In addition, we will also facilitate connections desired by the winners should they want to establish contacts in Europe. This could be to liaise them with research organizations in the field, connect them with any of the 600 plus Euraccess centers in Europe, or introduce them to prestigious European Research Council grantees or Mercury fellows. Last but not the least, as Isaac Newton famously said, what we know is a drop, what we do not know is an ocean. So I encourage you to remain curious, always, whatever the result of the finale is, keep your quest for answers to your queries always open. With that, good luck to all of you. I hope you have a good time ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and Congratulations to all finalists and participants of the Falling Walls finale and the whole Falling Walls competition in Australia. Um, I would like to congratulate you on your outstanding efforts to compress these grand research ideas into the very compressed Falling Walls format and to effectively communicate those ideas as well. My name is Katerina McGrath. I'm the director of the DAD Information Centre in Sydney and the DAD is the world's largest funding organization for the academic exchange of students and researchers on all career levels. We do have programs available for students, early career and senior researchers, and for academic collaboration. Um, the DAD is an independent organization of German higher education institutions and is funded by the German government to an extent. And there are basically three overarching goals for the coming years. We want to promote excellence and broaden the perspectives of education and science through international exchange. This is where our scholarships, uh, funding the mobility of students and researchers come into play. We also would like to enhance international collaboration for the benefit of science, industry and society. This is where our programs to support international uh, academic collaborations uh, feed in. And also we would like to assist with assuming global responsibility and contributing to development and peace. The Information Centre in Sydney provides information on funding programmes of the DAD, as well as on general study and research opportunities in Germany and other funding opportunities. We present information and updates on our website and also operate an office in Sydney and can be contacted uh, by a person by phone or email. For the Falling Walls winner this year, we are very proud to be able to sponsor a trip to Germany to participate in the finale in Berlin and in the program surrounding the finale, such as the Research in Germany Day, and provide the winner also with various networking opportunities. Uh, we were also very glad to work together with EREXES on the Falling Walls Lab Sydney, where the pre-selection of candidates for the finale took place for the states of New South Wales, South Australia, um, Victoria and Tasmania. Again, my heartfelt congratulations to all of you and on your outstanding efforts to communicate your scientific ideas. And please feel free to get in touch with us if you'd like to know more about study and research opportunities in Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Nishant. Thank you, Katerina. It's wonderful to have your access and DRRD as event partners, and we look forward to continuing our relationship with you into the future. So now, before we get to announce the winners, let us quickly recap our 10 presenters. 
Tess Brading from Queensland University of Technology, Mars Butfield Edison from the University of Tasmania, Shanal Kurup from the Australian Catholic University, Martino Malerba from Deakin University, Danielle Lee from Griffith University, Fiona Hashini Roymond Desmond Godfrey from Monash University, Marin Fraser from the Australian National University, Nipuni Pifa Fandridge from Queensland University of Technology, Oliver Lotz from the University of Sydney, and Clara Jiang from the University of Queensland. Thank you all for making your presentations and congratulations to be in this finale. Now, let's please welcome jury chair and Australian Academy of Science President, Professor Chanupati Yagadish to announce today's winners. Over to you. Thank you, Hans. I would like to first of all congratulate all our presenters on a wonderful job and presenting interesting cases on the next walls to fall. I now have the pleasure of announcing the official winners of Falling Walls Lab Australia 2022, who will be presenting Australia, representing Australia at the Falling Walls International events to be held in Berlin in November. It was not an easy task, and uh, the committee has had a jury has had a difficult time of choosing only three out of such a wonderful list of, of 10 candidates who have presented excellent work. I'm thrilled to announce third place awarded to uh, Mars uh, Butterfield, Butterfield Edison for her work on space debuts. Congratulations, and I would like to invite you to say a few words, Mars. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been amazing. I, I've just ducked out here from the Australian Space Research Conference in Sydney, where I've come with the most fantastic team who helps me work on such projects with the telescopes, both at CSIRO and at the University of Tasmania. Here in Australia, we have the most amazing uh, view of the sky and also big sensitive instruments to look at the sky with. So I think that it's amazing that we're making more opportunities to use them here. But I'm so, so grateful and I would really like to thank all the judges and especially I was so excited to meet Vanessa Moss finally because she's actually one of my career heroes who herself works on amazing scientific instrumentation with radio telescopes. So this is just amazing. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Mars. Congratulations again. Now second place is awarded to uh, Clara Chan. And uh, congratulations, hey. uh, Clara. And uh, hey. would you like to say a few words? Yes, um, I would like to thank the jury and I would also like to say well done to all the finalists and I'm very much looking forward to um, going to Berlin. Okay, good. Congratulations again, Tara. And uh, so the now uh, final, uh, the first presenter or uh, the first uh, uh, prize winner uh, to go to Berlin is the uh, is awarded to Marin Fraser for her work on malaria. And congratulations, Mary, and would like to say a few words. Well, thank you for such a wonderful opportunity. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience getting to present this part of my work to such a wonderful audience. And we've been having great conversations in the chat about anti-cholesterol drugs that could be also used for malaria as well. So it's been wonderful to go through this experience with such a lovely group of people. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mirren. And well done to all the presenters and also congratulations to our winners. Good luck to you in Berlin. Thank you, Yagadish. That was the tough decision and we have three winners. Congratulations to the three of you, but to all of them who presented. But let me also thank the jury because you came up with the question, you came up with the decisions. So let me recap. We have Professor Chenupati Yagadish, Professor Lynn Beasley, Mrs. Rosie Higgs, Dr. Hilary House, Dr. Vanessa Moss, Mr. Craig Pandy and Dr. Michael Schutz. Now, we have to thank 
the event partners and sponsors, both locally and globally, who make Fording Walls Lab possible, not just here, but around the world in 90 labs. We would encourage everyone to take part in the Berlin event this year. The Academy team will share details with those who are registered for today's event, so you will hear exactly what will happen. And so we hope that you can tune in in November. But let me finally mention the Academy meme, which is around me here. We haven't seen our producer, Hugh. We have people all around us. That makes it possible. A great thank you for all. And we'll continue to present to you the best in science in Australia. Now, this concludes the Falling Walls Lab Australia 22. I'm Professor Hans Bachwer. Good afternoon. Thank you.